But yeah, th th this is great. Um, I've been here before, but as, as Professor uh, um, Melanie was saying, I, the last two talks that I gave were during the life of iFi. This talk will be about everything that I learned in the last 11 plus years of starting iFi. So, quick favor, if you guys are okay with it, please don't tweet uh, and don't do social media. Um, because we had the exit less than a year ago, so there are some rules around talking about exits by the SEC and all this stuff. So just keep everything you know uh, among us and ask me questions. I, I, it's being videotaped, so that's okay. Just don't tweet um, in real time. That'll be awesome. Thank you. So how do we start? This is a photo of about 10 years ago. I was as tall, but I was probably a little bit thinner. Um, those are my three other co-founders. That was our first meeting at Sand Hill Road. So we're four friends, and um, Yuval was one of my first friends actually in the US since I was 13 years old. I met Baron and, and Eugene through Yuval about 20 years ago. Um, I've been in the US since 85, I'm Israeli. I met Yuval when we were in, in eighth grade uh, in the East Coast, and we, started by wanting to make cameras more fun to use and easier to share photos. This is before you know, the iPhone. So remember, around 2006, digital imaging was going at a massive rate up. Cameras became digital, it was totally awesome. But getting images out of a camera was a massive pain. You took the card out of the camera, put it, put it into your computer, upload, download, sort, it took energy, not rocket science. You guys are all technical, so it's easy for you to do. But for the mom and the dad that have kids that are busy, it, it takes energy to actually stop you know, what you're doing and do a chore. Doing dishes is a chore. Getting stuff um, uh, out of a camera is also a chore. So what we came up with, actually during that meeting was a time that we actually switched around our idea. We actually came up with a USB stick. And the USB stick was going to suck out the images out of the camera. And we want to model the photo industry. So you go to Costco, Walgreens, CVS, and it used to be that you dump your film in the canister, in the you know, big film dump, and then you get photos after half an hour. And that's how it used to be. So actually, it was very simple. You just took pictures, you went to CVS or Walgreens, the little clerk would puff some air into the camera, give you a new roll of film, and that was an entire market. And in fact, Flip had you know, a camera that was called the Flip Cam before they actually had the Flip Camcorder. That was around going into CVS, getting a digital camera, you know, replaced with the new flash, and you got photos out of it. But cameras became really cool, and they became really, really um, easy to use. But the part that happened after the click, see the click is very easy, the part that happens after the click is very hard. So we came up with a USB stick, but the VCs in Sand Hill Road said, hey, you guys are four geeks, um, you are clueless about retail, you have no idea how to do, how to approach Best Buy, Walmart, Target, and you're basing your entire future on this memory stick that would be dumped into the film canister that would give the, the customers uh, photos out, out, out of the camera. We had IP around having the, the USB stick protected. You would stick to the camera. It would only suck the camera's uh, images and, and videos out. You couldn't actually see in, in anything in it, same way as film was. And when you put the stick back into the retailer's bin, they would give you photos back and they would re-unlock the stick. So you have patents on this. But the VCs said, you guys are smoking crack. Nobody will actually do this because uh, there's no reason to actually believe that you four could do this. So idea number two was a memory card. The memory card was gonna basically be a smart memory card. So instead of taking photos and having them stored on a memory card that goes into your shoebox as a Roach Motel, um, the card would do everything for you in the background. So you focus on taking pictures, have fun, do all the magic with the camera, and the iFi card does everything for you. So that's, that's what we came up with. 
that drawing that you see on the left um, is the first schematic drawing that my co-founder did overnight. Um, my co-founders are such amazing rock stars in engineering. They're the reason that I left engineering and became a business development guy in marketing and sales because they're just so good at it. No reason for me to you know, you know, um, even attempt. So the, the, the schematic was the first thing that we did to prove we, we could actually cram a radio, a transceiver, flash, a CPU, um, a crystal, all onto the card. So we did that overnight. The middle card that you see is the world's most expensive memory card. That was about four grand to make because the mold for the plastic was about four grand. But that's, that happened after three months. We built out the card. We um, proved that we weren't smoking crack. We could do everything on, on our own. Behrend uh, wrote firmware for his own chip, which he designed for Atheros. Atheros um, is now owned by, by, by uh, I believe, Qualcomm or, or, or Broadcom. But there were radios back then by Broadcom, Marvell, and Atheros. We chose Atheros. The big chip that you see is the flash. The middle chip above that is the controller that does the reads and the writes between the camera and the, and the, and the, 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 the chip. And the, the little uh, chip on the top right corner is the crystal that does the radio frequency. So 2.4 gigahertz, 5.8 for N, G. So that was the card that we made after a few months. All the way, fast forward to our newest card, which we made before we got acquired about um, six months ago. That card had half a gig on it. Today's cards had 32 gigs. Of course, you can do 64, 128, you know, actually even a terabyte. But that card is what we had, the very last card that we had before we actually sold the company. So that's the history. Between that, I'll talk about a little bit of, of what, what we did. It's hard to see. Um, we raised about $50 million during this, the lifespan of the company. So by all measures, we're firing on all cylinders. We raised an A after we had revenue from beta. We had beta that basically, we pre-sold 10,000 cards at 100 bucks each. We couldn't even afford to make them, but we actually sold beta cards. This is before Kickstarter, before Indiegogo. So we, in a way, crowdfunded our, our company because we didn't raise the money yet from the VCs, but we raised from Angel. So I actually raised a million dollars for, uh, for us with my co-founder the first year. So we raised a million from angels. Then we had beta. Then we had revenue, real revenue. So then we raised the A, five and a half million on the A, paired with one million from the seed. Unconvertible note, same rules as today. Main difference is we had no caps back then. Today you actually have a cap on convertible note. Um, launched the company, actually pre-launched it by mistake, lessons learned, never pre-launch until you're actually ready. So 2006, Q3, we actually launched in retail. We were finally ready, we raised our money, we hired a new CEO to help us with a retail launch, and we launched at Amazon and BestBuy.com, Costco.com, all of the online retailers, but not brick and mortar, so just online. It was easier for us to maintain our inventory as a small company and not go into mass retail, learn from our mistakes, do it only online, and then after, after you know, we learned from our mistakes, we then went into mass retail. We raised a B and a C every year and a half. Typically, you raise venture. So every, every time that you raise, you raise hopefully on an up round. Otherwise, you, if you're doing a down round, it means you actually have, have more dilution, and it's horrible. Each one of our raises was always an up round. So six and a half, 12, 18, and 20. Our last round was from Docomo. Docomo gave us um, $20 million to build their cloud. And that was an evaluation of about 120 million uh, post. So, grew the company, had sales in every major retailer in every major country, uh, 48 countries, sold millions of cards, uh, online, brick and mortar, um, globally. 
So pretty much you can see every major retailer from every country in every region we've covered. It was totally awesome. Um, we also did something really, really major. These memory cards were being seen by the camera as a memory card only, but the card had to, up, had, had to upload the photos to either your phone, this is fast forwarding now, now the cards are going to your phone or your iPad or your Android or your computer at home or the cloud, anywhere. They're going everywhere. So the card has to upload and it, it, it needs power. If it doesn't have power, it can't upload. The power is being given to it by the camera, so the card slot is powering it. If the camera is being turned off, there's no power, we can't upload. So we had deals with every major camera company in Japan, actually uh, um, also Korea and Germany, but most of the companies are in Japan. So the top 12 OEMs put firmware in the camera for us that um, would basically mean that if the cam sorry, if the, um, chewing my, my uh, cough drop, if the camera saw the card is still uploading, it would still keep power to the card slot. When the card was done uploading, it would tell the camera, turn off, and the camera turned off. This is pretty monumental for a small company in the Bay Area to have the inroads with 12 of the biggest camera companies in the world go into tens of millions of units shipped. So first it was Nikon, we didn't believe that they actually, when they came to us, we actually didn't believe they would not screw us, but we were told that if somebody from, from Japan comes to you and they, and they promise you that they actually will uh, work with you, you should trust them. Best thing we've done, because Nikon supported us in the camera, and what Nikon did, everybody else followed suit. So I call it stacking. Don't go after, uh, after your tier one um, OEM or you know, dream come true company at first, go after tier two or tier three. In our case, Nikon actually is one of the top three com uh, companies, but once they believed in us and once they put us into their firmware of all the cameras, everybody else followed suit. And like literally there's no company today that makes cameras that doesn't have IFS support in the camera. Even, though they, even if they have Wi-Fi built in today, they have iFi because iFi actually does the Wi-Fi better. So by every measure, we're doing everything right. We hired awesome CEOs, we kept growing, we, up, we opened offices all over. Um, uh, so we had an office in Europe, an office in Asia, an office here, an office in, uh, in LA. Totally awesome. Had major deals with every major camera guy and major deals with every major retailer. So we're firing on all cylinders. So, what we should have done is exit then. And we had chances to. And, but we had the most amazing fun, right? I mean, we're seeing success, we're seeing sales keep growing, the camera, the camera um, uh, industry, even though it started to flatten out because of smartphones, as, the camera, as cameras became flat, and flat means instead of selling 80 million you know, a year, units, they sold 70 million units a year, still a big market. Um, we added more countries and more areas and more continents and more distribution. So as the camera industry tried to flat and go down, we still grew. And year over year, we still did the right thing. We still grew the business. We still became more and more profitable. It was just totally amazing to see the company grow. But we didn't exit. So. It's actually the last thing you want to do when you're having fun. Literally, when you're having fun, you don't want to stop. And that's the biggest lesson that if you guys take from, from today, um, when you're having the most fun, you're going to have chances to exit. And people will come to you and offer you maybe meaningful offers, maybe, you know, maybe not. But you will not be thinking about it at all. You're thinking about growing the business, hiring, doing the best thing for the business and for your investors, which usually doesn't mean stopping soon. It means keep, keep the business going and growing it. But what you should be doing is when you have the most fun, 
that's when you exit. So you really, this is a major, major lesson. And I think the companies like YouTube did it right. Companies like Instagram did it right. Um, there are many companies that thought that they would not catch it right and didn't want to exit because they um, thought that if they exit, they would lose their culture, lose their team, lose their product. Maybe, but usually what happens is when you get acquired or when you exit, um, you actually have more funding to do your stuff and you have more revenue and more resources to actually work on your baby. So putting it into, into a, you know, actual graphic because you guys are all engineers, so you're geeky, so I get it. So your life or the company will be a massive chaos. You'll have ups and downs. It's gonna be insane. Overall though, you should see the trend going up and you'll feel it. Employees feel it. You as a co-founder feel, uh, uh, will feel it. Your VCs will feel it. If you don't go up overall, even though you'll have tons of bumps in the road, you'll know. Your employees will know, they will leave. Your VCs will know, they'll put pressure on you to put in a, a, a new CEO or hire a new VP of marketing. We've gone through all that stuff. But overall, we had a massive, beautiful you know, yeah, graph up. So you'll feel it, and as you feel it, you really should be uh, thinking, when do you actually exit? So here's putting everything into a picture. The optimal exit is when you're having the most fun. And that's what, what I will keep claiming and that's what people will argue that you should keep having fun and, and keep you know, building the business. But actually, if you time it right, the optimal way to make the most for your investors, for your employees, for yourself, is when you're having the most fun. Most companies miss that point. I, if I did, they, some companies, some, some entrepreneurs catch it right on top and mind-blowing. I mean, for example, the founder of Flip sold Flip to Cisco, caught it right on top. He's brilliant in raising money. He's, he's brilliant in exiting. Cisco, a year and a half later, killed Flip because they knew that the smartphone is going to kill the camcorder industry. But Flip did an amazing job. They went to retail. They had the best camera out there with a single red button. It was amazing. They hurt the entire camcorder industry and they had the best product and they had the best timed exit. So they literally caught it right on top because they were about to crest. And Jonathan Kaplan, hat off to him, did an amazing job. And there are a few other uh, cases, but not many. Most companies either go down, most go down, um, and they had a curve, but they didn't even realize they actually had a curve. But so that they fume out, they run out of money, whatever. But you know, most companies go down. Some of them had the, the, the chance but didn't, and some do exit, and that's where iFi was. They exit, but they exit too late. So by the time that you exit, your market is starting to shrink. Uh, everyone knows it, so your offer is gonna come in at a lower price. So iFi had an exit, made some money, could have made way more money if we did it earlier. So that's the big lesson learned um, that only a very, very, very small portion of companies do time it right. Most never time it, and some will time it, but they will time it incorrectly. So you're asking, you know, if you're having fun, why actually stop? Um, and if you're having fun and you're stopping because you've exited, will you literally stop having fun? And the answer is no, you will not. You will keep having fun because you'll have more of these resources. Uh, so for example, take, let's take um, Instagram, for example. They were big, but they became way bigger as part of Facebook because they had the resources. YouTube was big, they, they became infinitely bigger as uh, part of Google. They didn't lose the culture, they didn't lose the core, they didn't lose any of the products. They, they, they became massive because of Google's funding. So the founders made money and they kept growing it. So it's not the case that if you actually exit, you will lose out. Uh, in many cases, you will not. Um, and 
this is really the biggest uh, uh, lesson that that uh, we learned. Um, had I had this insight five years ago when, when we raised our 20 million on 120, I would have exited then. Um, we had we had offers throughout the, the company's uh, history, and we always want to just keep building the business and keep doing what, 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 what we're doing. And that was a mistake. Um, will the company that acquires you kill your culture? Sometimes, but those, those things are all negotiable. So let's say that you're getting an offer to be acquired. And right now, by the way, I'm in the middle of doing it again, but this time, I'm going to time it actually right. So my current company, we're in, in the middle of an M&A process, and that's why I'm saying don't tweet. Um, and we're actually going to time it right. We, we realized there was a window, we're doing it right, but this time the management team is much, much more senior than what we were when we were doing it. Uh, and that's really why, why I joined them. And so it's possible that your culture will be changed, but all those things can be negotiated. If you get acquired, you can say, keep my company here, keep my, my uh, building here, keep my core engineers here. Or you can say, okay, I'm okay moving over to you guys. But all those things are negotiable. And the more seniority that you have in doing this, the, uh, the more likely you are to actually have an outcome that is good for you guys, the founders, and for the, and the employees, and the VCs. That's it. Short, sweet, let's have questions. Thank you. And I didn't even cough too much, so this is great. Yeah. What do you think about cases like Facebook who, who had the option to exit, on, I believe, around 2006 when they were having fun? Um, they didn't do it, and it seems like it was the right move. Yeah. So the question was, um, I would really think of Facebook that had a chance to exit, didn't, and of course they, um, they, they did it right by not exiting. Um, absolutely. With, with um, uh, a business, like everything in life, there's tons of luck that plays into this. So serendipity is something that usually you, don't, you actually don't talk about in MBA school, engineering school. You talk about building bits and bytes and that if you do the right thing, you'll grow the business. Luck is a massive force in business. Luck, serendipity, completely massive, massive forces. Um, who knows what, what would have happened? Facebook, of course, is amazing today, um, but there are only a few Facebooks, a few Instagrams, a few YouTubes. I'm trying to, to tell you guys how to do it when, when you're not that size. And don't hope for a Facebook. You know, everyone hopes for a Facebook and an Instagram and YouTube. Great, but I'm being pragmatic here. I'm saying you probably will not be a Facebook or a Snapchat. Um, also Snapchat, they had offers to get acquired for 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion, then 10 billion. They now just raised 4 billion. Uh, they're gonna IPO. So they held out. Awesome. I hope that they succeed. Uh, you never know, but because they, they may IPO and who knows what will happen after, after that the IPO, but they held out. They are doing the right thing, probably for them, uh, and they held out. But had they exited at one billion, two or three, when they were offered to, to be acquired by Facebook, for example, who knows if they would have changed their uh, path or not? You just, you just don't know. But there is a saying, you know, a bird in the hand you know, is better than nothing, right? So the Bay Area tries to tell you to go for these massive billion dollar exits, and hold out for the massive exit. And until you hold out for that, you're not gonna be um, good. What I'm saying is it's better to have a few small exits, keep doing that, and keep having the exits and keep building um, value for your shareholders and for yourself, versus hold out for 10 years, and then maybe or maybe not exit. Any more questions? Don't be shy. Yep. Uh, there's a saying that baseball games are won by base hits and not home runs. Uh, 
does this mean you're all done, washed up, and, and the rest of your life is ruined, or do you have plans now? So the question was, <coughs> sorry, now I'm coughing. The question was, um, Am I done, washed out, or do I have plans to have more fun? Um, no, no, we're gonna keep having fun. And I'm 44, I have at least 20 years of work, and even if, I, if tomorrow I, I retired, I would probably still keep working. Um, so I'm gonna keep doing this, because, because being an uh, entrepreneur is really a disease, because you keep doing it, even though it's the worst thing ever. You get crap from every angle, and it's the hardest thing that you'll ever do, and you're gonna keep doing it. So I'm gonna keep doing it, and, but while I'm doing it, I'm gonna to try to actually exit and make money out of it um, while having fun. But it really is a disease, because you get punished and you keep doing it. So, so what's the next new thing? So right now, I'm at a company that was started by one of my iFi co-founders, and uh, we started to actually build out a smart camera. So we're building a smart camera, and uh, we have an amazing company in Japan that's sponsoring us to build a smart camera. And at the same time, we, we actually realized that while building this, this uh, smart camera, everything that we built for this technology in terms of Android and Linux being real-time and hard real-time and vision can be applied to many things like, like robotics, like cars, like uh, cameras, um, anything that needs real hard time, Linux and Android. So we're selling. We, we finished the project for this company in Japan and um, I'm on the road selling, having, having a blast. And this time, we're gonna time it right. And then after, you know, after this, I'll hopefully make tons of money, keep doing it. It's just can't, can't, can't stop. Yep. When you develop the, the iFi car, yep. this one, then how did you protect yourself so that the big companies didn't yeah. see your idea? Great question. So the question was, while we were building it, how did we uh, protect ourselves from companies stealing it? Um, execution. So we have patents. We have many patents filed. And for seven years, we had no competitors. Because what we did actually is really hard to do. In terms of, I mean, we really built the world's smallest computer. It's a real, it's a real computer with a TCP IP stack. It's doing a lot of things that your normal computer does, but it's inside a memory card. But doing that well is really, really hard. So eventually, seven years later, a company in China started to copy us, but it did a horrible job, horrible, horrible job. Um, so it, that went nowhere because it really is hard to make to, to, to actually do right. And even if you did do it right, they didn't have all of our deals with the camera guys. So even if the card came in, they couldn't emulate our iFi card because we had IP that was with the camera guys. So uh, it's not patents. Patents will never protect you because big companies will come in and hurt you and you can't afford to actually sue them because they're just massive and you're small. So it really is execution. We kept hammering it, and we kept doing amazing things, and we kept growing. Uh, eventually, we had Toshiba um, in Japan do an okay job, and what we didn't do right is we filed our patents in the US and in Europe, and not in Japan. Of course, we didn't do China because China, there's no reason to file anything there because this is pointless. But Japan, we should have filed. We didn't, so, 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 so Toshiba went after us, even though their card was inferior to ours, they actually went after us in Japan, and Japan was our home turf because we did all these camera deals, so that did start to hurt. Um, today, if you go to iFi's website and you, and, and you actually click on the word buy, it points you to Toshiba's Amazon card. So we actually did, as we exit, sell portion of, of our IP to, to Toshiba, and the company is not part of Rico Pentax. So, our exit was selling the cloud part, the cloud, the infrastructure, the entire app uh, layer to Rico Pentax, and the card business to Toshiba. So they wanted to actually have our IP in the cameras and they couldn't, so they bought that part. But for the most part, you can't have any, any protection, it's just your execution. Yep. How's the landscape of venture capital changing? Okay, so the question is, how is the landscape changing for venture capital? Um, 
this year will be a good year because they were really worried for a while, so they actually sat on their funds. So they've been sitting on their funds for a long time, for about two years, uh, because of worried, you know, um, of what will happen. So this year will be a year, so they have these massive funds that they're sitting on, so they actually have to actually start to spend it. So you see a good year for, for venture capital, um, but it's gonna be the same thing. VCs will always invest when there's commotion on the street. So if you go Sand Hill Road, and if you have one VC that's interested, they'll go to you know, the Madeira restaurant on Sand Hill Road, right? There's that hotel and the restaurant where all the VCs hang out. Once there's commotion in the street, you'll get calls from other VCs as well. So what will happen is, um, you have to create commotion, and that'll always be, be the case. You, you, you know, they will go for ideas that they believe are only good if they've been funded by angels. What you should have probably asked is, how is the angel market changing? Because the VC's market hasn't, hasn't really changed um, that much. They're bankers, they have LPs. These LPs are colleges, usually. They invest in the fund. So the VC market hasn't really changed the, the model. The angels have changed because the angels are the ones who actually got screwed by the VCs. So it used to be that there was no cap on the convertible note term sheets, now there are caps, but still what happens is angels get washed out by the VCs. So they realize they get washed out, angel list started becoming big, but finding an angel on angel list is tough because they only go for companies they've already had funding before. So it's, it's sort of like you know a, a chicken and egg. So if you have some funding from friends and family, you can go to angel list, and you can get some funding from some angels. But the way that has changed is now they have these syndicates. And the syndicates work like VC funds, but they're not a VC fund, they're actually a collection of small angels that go in together. So your parents, your, parents, your sisters, your friends and family can be in a syndicate, and you wouldn't take their money because they were your parents or, 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 or your family, and you shouldn't take their money because the money is not very green, and if you want, I'll, I'll mention what I mean by that. But a syndicate is a basket of other angels that are taking the risk together because there's one guy who's controlling the syndicate who's, who, who gets a carry, same way as VCs do. So, so the VCs get a carry by managing the, the, the uh, company. And so the controlling um, manager of the syndicate on angel list has a carry. So when any company is in the basket of the company's exit, they get more from the fund. So AngelList really changed it, um, and syndicates really changed the angel platform. So that way the angels get screwed less. Any more questions? Yep. How did you meet with your co-founders and determine that this is the right person I'm going to co-found the company with? Okay, so the question was how did we meet as co-founders and how, how did we decide this is the right thing to do? Um, <coughs> sorry. So, I'll answer it in two ways. Um, start a company with people that you love and people that you're friends with because you're gonna see them way more than you're gonna be seeing your spouse or your partner. So, we're friends. And we started with the belief that we can change the camera industry. We had an idea. We had two different ideas that kind of morphed into one idea, but we had, we saw this need and we wanted to solve it and we saw that nobody else is solving it. So we started having, you know, meetups. We still had our day jobs and we still got a salary. I'm a huge fan of not stopping cold turkey and not, and not stopping the money for flowing in because if it does, then you'll be um, really, really hard pressed to sometimes make the wrong decisions. If you actually have some income flowing in at the beginning, you can save up. When you're young, that's awesome. You can save up, and if you're still single, you don't have the mortgage and the kids. I, I already had the mortgage and the kids, so, uh, and it was still painful. We had, we had hot dogs for a year, but we went full time when we raised our first angel, because then we knew, okay, we have something here. It was easy to raise for, for the first angel, and, and after having him, we had the next 11 also fairly easily. So um, I'm a fan of bootstrapping it for as long as you can. Keep you, your day job when you have a team around you that believes in you and your co-founders believe in you and you believe in them. 
then you can go full time. Um, in terms of finding co-founders, meetups. If you don't have a network, so I had a network. I've been here for since, 80, since 92 off and on, but 92 was my first full time here. So I've been here for by then about 10 years, 15 years. So I had a network. If you have no network, meetups. There's tons of meetups. Yeah. You speak about angels and uh, VCs. Mm -hmm. uh, which ones are, are the simplest to get funds from? Okay, so the question was, if you compare angels to VCs, which ones are the easiest uh, to get funds from? Angels will be the ones who believe in your dream, and they'll give you 50K, 100K, and then there's the super angels that give you millions. Um, but if you go for friends and family, um, I would say only go for friends and family that have at least a net worth of a million dollars. So if they give you 50K, they won't come after you if you actually lost the 50K, because uh, the odds are you will, you will lose their money much more than you actually make the money. So their money is not as green as a VC that can actually give you introductions, for example. So what happens is when you go to angels, you should go for angels that for them, 50K is for the normal person like, like five bucks, 10 bucks. It means nothing to them. So if they can spend on you 50K, it, it doesn't come off the bottom line. It's easy for them to actually um, uh, accept. So angels are way easier because there are many more of them. Most of the Apple, Facebook, Google employees are angels. You know, anyone with at least $1 million of net worth can be an accredited investor. An accredited investor can invest 50K uh, and above. And I wouldn't take money for less than 50K because if you take money from 25K or 10K, for example, it costs money to take money. So if you, inv if you take money from uh, an angel and they're a friend of yours, but they only wanted to give you 25K, that's dangerous because they couldn't feel comfortable with 50K or 100K. Uh, 25K is not a lot, and it means that they had enough pain to give you 50. And it means that if you actually do lose their money, 25 to them will be a lot more meaningful than a million or 10 million to a VC. So their money is less green than the VC's money, but they're easy to get money from. Makes sense. And are, are there restrictions on the numbers of investors? So, are there um, any restrictions on the number of investors? No, so if the more you raise, the more you dilute. So the way that it works is you have a cap table and the cap table can keep growing. And the more angels that you take money from, the more pieces of company you gave up. So you have evaluation. And evaluation, there are three buckets typically in the Bay Area. And there's West Coast rules and there's East Coast rules. The West Coast rules have West Coast term sheets, which means that you're gonna um, start the company and you incorporate and you create 10 million shares. And if you're one founder, you have 10 million shares to yourself. And that's every company that incorporates has 10 million shares. And if you're two co-founders and you equally split, five million each. Except that you build, you say have four million each and you, and you, and you leave two million for the employee pool. Um, now that, that two million, is then gonna be shared among the other investors because you have common shares and you have preferred shares. So you make shares, so every time that you actually give money away, sorry, whenever you actually take money in from, from investors, you give stock away. And that stock dilutes you and your co-founders and your employees. So let's say that you're in the bucket of zero to six million, then there's six to eight, and then there's eight to 12. If you're in the zero to six million bucket, which means you have no traction, no revenue, nothing, you're a baby, um, and you take in, let's say, uh, 600K, you've now given away 10% of your company. So, fine, but that 600K was important to you, so for you, 10% is meaningful. Uh, if you took in a million dollars, you give away a lot more than 10% because your cap was still six million. If your cap was 10 million or 20 million, you'll give away less. But there's a problem with being overcapitalized, which means that you have a huge, uh, a huge uh, 
valuation, which means that you think, oh, I'm cool, I'm amazing, I'm gonna have this massive valuation because I want to, to have uh, uh, myself and my, and my employees dilute less. Problem is, if you dilute less, and if you have a massive uh, valuation at say 20 million or, or, or 30 million, and then you wanna go and raise an A, your A has to now be 50 million or 80 million. Your, your H round has to be higher than, the, than, the, than the, the previous one, otherwise it's a down round. So if you go for way too high on the seed or on the A, you're screwing yourself over and you're becoming overcapitalized. Many, many um, uh, founders make that mistake. We didn't, but many founders do. So we were very conservative. Our, our six and a half million was an evaluation of um, 12 pre 18 post, right? So the 12 plus the six is 18. Our B was an evaluation of 25. Our C was an evaluation of 40. And our D was an evaluation of 120. So each, each round we grew the valuation. That, that's how you do it. If you don't do that and you're not conservative at um, uh, the, the beginning, what happens is you will shoot yourself in the foot later on. And you will hurt and you'll lose employees. And it happens to many companies. More questions on funding or anything you want. As you can see, I'm pretty much open book. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you.